Hello everyone. Uh, I want to start the lecture with um, a case history, actually two case histories, and then I'll talk about uh, uh, soil strength. So I'll, I'll turn off the lights so you can see better. So these are two case histories related to uh, uh, the foundation of light buildings on shrink soil soils, typically houses. So these are the credits uh, of the information that I collected. And uh, here, so here's the issue. Uh, in the summer, when you have, uh, particularly in, in the Texas area, uh, the soil shrinks and swells with the seasons. So on the left-hand side, you might have a situation in the summer, the house is right here, the sun uh, evaporates the moisture from the soil and the soil shrinks on the outside and uh, the outside goes down but the center is covered by the house so the shrinkage is not as much under the center and so this, the house is bendy and then you could have trees on the outside as well and trees uh, pump a tremendous amount of water to, for their, their survival basically and so that adds to compounds the problem and, and you, uh, you have an issue. In the winter, the soil swells uh, as it rains on the outside and the soil swells on the outside, but it doesn't swell under the center because the, the house is covering it. So that bends the house the, the other way and that cracks uh, the material. And, and when you think about it, you know, we build houses out of materials that are very brittle, uh, like bricks and cement and stucco and and tiles and things like this and so we really are not helping each other much uh, we should be using materials that are much more flexible uh, so that uh, the, the cracks would not appear uh, so so early you know material maybe we ought to think about rubber cements and rubber bricks and, and things of this nature uh, so here are some examples you can see in this case uh, the photo is not very good but you can see that this part of the house has gone down because the crack is, is largest at the top than at the, beginning, uh, at, the, at the bottom. And looking at the cracks, when you observe a house that is in distress, looking at the cracks gives you a good idea of how the house is actually uh, moving. Uh, here is another case of a house in distress. You can see again, the crack is higher, largest at the top and smallest at the bottom. So this corner of the house is probably going down uh, to create a crack like this. And uh, here's another example of trees. You can see the tree here is creating some, some problems. The trees here are, are creating cracks in that uh, uh, retaining wall. So uh, obviously it's a, it's a serious uh, issue. So let's go back to some fairly fundamental issues. Uh, the, uh, so we're at the beach. Actually, this picture is in uh, Corpus Christi, and we have a small cliff made of silty sand, and you can identify three zones. Obviously, the, the water, the, the Gulf of Mexico is here, so below this level, the soil is saturated, and the water is in uh, compression. You can calculate the water pressure by uh, hydrostatic uh, equation. So this material is saturated, it doesn't swell, it can shrink, obviously, if you expose it to the sun. Uh, above this, you have a zone that is saturated by capillary action. In other words, the water is sucked up into the small pores of this soil here because of a fundamental attraction between water and silica. And so this zone, uh, whoops, wrong way. This zone right here is saturated. It can swell because if you give it more water, it will increase in volume. And it can shrink because you can lose the water from the pores. And so this zone actually can swell and shrink. This zone right here, you can see the lighter color. It is unsaturated. And this material uh, has some water, but not as much as it is not saturated and it can swell, uh, but it cannot shrink because it is below the shrinkage limit, also called the air entry value. 
So here are the various solutions that exist for uh, shallow foundations or for foundations of light buildings on shrink swell soils. Top left is what is called the stiffened slab on gray. Uh, and the idea is sometimes called a waffle slab. Uh, in this case, you have a slab on the ground. The ground surface is, is right here. And you have some beams every so often in both directions. And this is a good solution because the whole idea to make sure the foundation is, is suitable is to make sure that whatever the soil wishes to do, the foundation will not bend uh, such that the house would be in distress. So there is a, you want to make the foundation relatively rigid in bending so that whatever the soil does, the foundation will not bend uh, significantly and therefore the house on top will not bend and you won't have the crack. So this is a good solution provided the EI, the bending stiffness of the uh, foundation is sufficient. Here is another solution. So th this one is about uh, $10 a square foot in terms of price or maybe $100 per square meter. The second solution is more expensive. It's called elevated structural slab on pier. And you can see here we have the same situation basically. The slab is here, the beams are uh, right here, and there's a gap between the slab and the ground surface. And the slab is suspended above ground on uh, resting on piles going down to a certain level. And, and this is a good solution provided the piles go below the zone of soil that's going to go up and down with the seasons. Uh, you know, sometimes I go see homeowners that have problems and, and uh, they, they mention that they have this type of solution, but then I ask how deep the piles are and they say seven, eight feet, and, and that's well within the zone that's moving up and down, so that really doesn't solve the problem. So in this case, you've got to make sure that the piles are going down uh, below the zone that's uh, uh, active uh, during the season. And, and this solution is a good one. Uh, but it's probably uh, 15 to 20 dollars a square foot so it, it's more expensive than this one <clears throat> some argue that you create a space here where the water can collect and you could make a, you know sort of a bathtub uh, location right here uh, I, I favor this uh, solution this solution right here is called Steven slab on grade and on piers uh, the, the slab is on the ground surface and you have the beams, again, in both directions. And then the piers are underneath it. And the piers are anchoring the slab. In other words, if the soil wants to push, wants to swell, it's going to push the slab upward. And the piers are going to say, you're not going anywhere. And the slab, the soil is going to say, yes, you are. And then you end up breaking the slab. So this is really not a good solution. Please do not use this solution for light buildings. Uh, and then the last one is post-tension slab uh, on, uh, on grade. And again, this is a good solution provided the bending stiffness of the foundation is high enough that if the soil wants to move up and down, then the slab doesn't bend and therefore the structure above it doesn't bend, uh, thus limiting the amount of damage that you can, uh, that you, that you can tolerate. Uh, it's also a very good solution, and I'll show you an example, for uh, playing surfaces like tennis courts. This is a good solution for tennis courts because you don't have a structure on top of the tennis court, and, and so, uh, but you, don't, you want to minimize the crack. You know, the the post-tensioning will definitely minimize the crack of the, uh, of, of the slab. Um, so here is, ah, this is, <laughs> this is my house. Um, and looking at it, you've got the, the house right here, the swimming pool, the tennis court. And we monitored the behavior of the tennis court. So, you know, I bought the house in, uh, well, I bought the land in 1989. And you can see the plasticity index, 61, 42. So it was really a, a very shrinking and swelling soils. And I had to be very careful 
as to what uh, solution I was choosing. So we put the, the house on the uh, uh, stiffen slab on gray, the waffle slab. Uh, the beams are about uh, 36 inches and 42 inches deep in both directions. Uh, when it comes to the pool, you got to be sure that you don't have any leaks, obviously. And uh, typically, the walls of the pool uh, are made of concrete, and uh, it's uh, it's relatively thick uh, concrete wall. And you have to monitor if you start seeing that the pool, the water level drops down uh, in the summer. You're going to have a lot of evaporation, and uh, very hot days. You know, you could. Uh, lose one inch of evaporation in a week. Uh, this is normal evaporation. But if you see things that are more rapid than one inch in a week, then you may have a leak, and then you've got to address that very quickly, because the pool uh, being close to the house, uh, you know, you could really mess up your foundation. And then, so the house, uh, as I told you, was was on a, on a slab on grade here, the beams every so often in both directions. So it's very difficult to actually bend that waffle slab. And we designed this, uh, these slabs on the basis of a tributary area. I'm not gonna go into that. I just wanna show you some. So this is the plan view of the house. Now you can't see much on this. This is a foundation plan. It's very important if you ever buy a house that you ask, uh, for the foundation plan, if it's an existing house. As for the foundation plan, and if uh, th then you can study what kind of foundation uh, you have under the house. It, it's, it's important to check this. You see, you see here beams in both directions uh, to, to stiffen the, uh, the foundation. And here is the, the beams you can see here. There are three foot six inches here and three foot uh, deep uh, in, the, in the center of the house. Now, when it comes to post-tension uh, tennis courts, then uh, you can see here the, the, the court is being prepared. You have the cables for the post-tensioning, and they're gonna come through at the ends here, and we're gonna pour the concrete. Once the concrete is poured, the cable comes out, and you can grab the cable and Pull, push against the concrete to tension the cable to uh, a certain uh, uh, tension uh, level. So here is the uh, the structure, and the, this uh, court, this uh, tennis court has been in place for uh, oh uh, uh, my goodness, yeah, thirty years, uh, thirty years, and uh, very very little cracking. So it's performed very well under this uh, post tensioning. And this is, uh, we monitored the movement of the tennis court, so this is the distance across the court. You have about 18 meters, and you can see that at the center of the court it doesn't move, but on the edges it goes up and down quite a bit. So that's the influence of the seasons, and you can see this distance is about five meters. Uh, so five meters from the outside, the, the soil is moving and uh, forcing the, uh, the uh, uh, post-tension slab to move up and down, but as I mentioned, no cracking. Here is a second uh, case history, and uh, this one is the Allison building. Uh, so note the trees here, because that's going to become important. All the trees have been removed to prepare for the site, and then uh, grading, and now preparation of this slab, you can see first we put a layer of plastic to prevent uh, moisture to come through into the building through the concrete. Here are the beam locations. You can see the uh, reinforcement as well. Then we pour the concrete. Uh, if it's in the summer, we do that at night to avoid the high temperatures. And then in the morning, the slab is polished and finished. We cover it with thermal blankets to again avoid the cracking. The building is erected. And uh, we monitored, again, uh, here's the finished product. Uh, and here's, again, the, uh, the movement of the building across the slab. And you can see under the center, there's no movement. But at the edges, there's up and down quite a bit. And again, we find this uh, five, six meter zone 
of movement at the edges, and so that's what we want to minimize with a stiff uh, foundation. And then the, the last slide here, let's look at the cost of the foundation. So the foundation with these uh, 42 inch deep beams was $100 per square meter. If I say, well, I'm going to save on the foundation by putting the half, half depth of beams, uh, and then so I reduce the price to $60 per square meter. The completed building, the entire building is $1,600 per square meter. So the increase in cost when I go from 60 to 100 is $40 or 2.5% of the building cost. But because you multiply the beam depth by two, you multiply the EI by eight because remember EI is I is BH cubed over 12, so 2 times cubed is 8, and so you increase the stiffness 8 times, but the foundation increase in cost is 2.5% of the building cost. So it's really not worth saving on the foundation because it's very difficult to, uh, to fix the foundation. You can always fix the roof, you can fix the walls, but fixing the foundation is very difficult. So if anything, don't skip on the foundation, skip on the roof if you wish, you can fix it later. Uh, but this is critically important. All right, let me put the light back on, and then we'll move to uh, the talk about our shear strength. Uh, one, two, three, four. And then I'll do this. This. All right, so the topic today is uh, shear strength of sorts, a very important topic. You know, we just looked at uh, foundation, and uh, uh, it, when we design foundation, there are really two topics that are important, uh, ultimate bearing capacity and uh, settlement and movement. So what I showed you here was the movement of the foundation uh, going up and down and trying to limit it. Uh, typically in foundations, uh, uh, you know, we have problems of settlement uh, and so we need to limit the amount of settlement, but uh, we also have to make sure that we place a pressure on the soil that is uh, within acceptable limit limits compared to the ultimate pressure which actually would, uh, would uh, sink the structure like we, we saw with the uh, Tower of Pisa earlier in the course. So, soil strength. So the, the topic is soil strength. And any time you talk about uh, strength of a material, there are three strengths. Uh, the first one is compression. So you have compression strength. You have tension strength. And you have shear strength. The compression strength um, is defined as if you take a cube of soil like this and you apply a pressure this way, a pressure that way, a pressure, the same pressure, a hydrostatic pressure around the soil element and you try to crush it. Uh, obviously soils are very strong in compression. Uh, what are some materials that are weak in compression? Uh, 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 rice krispies. You know, if you if you try to crush uh, rice krispies, you're going to collapse it. Um, and and uh, maybe uh, cork. Uh, things that have voids in them uh, tend to be weak in compression. Tension. Of course, if you take a, a, a piece of soil and you try to pull on it, it's not going to resist very much. So tension is definitely a weak link for soil. The good news is that because of geostatic stresses, the fact that there is gravity, uh, the soil is pre-compressed. It's under an existing compression before you do anything. So we rarely go into tension in soils, uh, sometimes in slow stability and things. But So while tension is definitely a weak link, it's really not uh, um, a case that we see very often. However, when it comes to shear, in other words, if you take 
a piece of, of soil like this and you try to push on the top and push the other way on the bottom, then you're going to shear the material and that shear strength is actually a very critical strength for the soil because it governs the design of foundations, of slopes, of retaining walls. So from now on, if I, if I don't mention anything in particular, when I talk about strength, I mean shear strength. How do we measure the shear strength since it's uh, so important to us? Well, we run tests, we go to the field, uh, we collect samples, we bring them back to the lab, and in the lab, we run some shear tests. So these shear tests are uh, a number of, of uh, different uh, tests, but in essence, we're going to try to obtain the shear stress and the shear strain. And as we deform the material in shear, we're going to record the uh, behavior of that material and we're going to get something like this. In some cases, not always. All right? there, there are times where this is typical of an over-consolidated material, and we'll talk about this uh, later in, uh, in class. But uh, in this case, you can see that the peak value right here, this would be the shear strength. Okay, that's the peak value right here. Shear strength, shear strength, shear strength, shear strength, boom, shear strength. That's as much as the sword can resist. That's the shear strength of the material. Now, I want to take a minute to uh, remind you of, so the shear stress, remember, is a stress that exists on a plane and is in the direction of the plane. The shear strain, if you take a cube and you apply a shear stress at the top and the shear stress at the bottom, this material is going to deform and it's going to go something like that. Okay? And this is delta y, let's say, and this is going to be y or H, let's call it H. And for small strain theory, we will have gamma equal delta Y over H, okay? So that's the shear strain, and then we do tests like this, um, and that's how we determine the, the, the shear strength. That shear strength is quite low uh, for soils, uh, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, values, so we'll call this one shear strength, uh, let's say tau failure, okay? So tau failure in soils uh, varies from 5 to 500 kPa. 500 is quite high, actually, all right? So this is the range of of shear strength values you can expect from so if you see anything much outside this re, uh, range of values either you made a mistake in the calculations or or it's a very un unusual soil this is much lower than what you could get for concrete for steel for some of the materials other materials that uh, even plastic that we use uh, in uh, in uh, civil engineering okay so first thing is that Shear strength of soil is uh, very important to us. This is how we get it. Now let's develop the uh, fundamental equation that will allow us to calculate the shear strength of soil given a certain set of conditions like under the foundation of a building. And for this, I'm going to create a set of uh, experiments, and I'm going to start with uh, experiment number one. So, experiment one. And the experiments are going to become 
more and more complicated. But the first experiment is quite simple. It consists of taking a block of concrete, and the block of concrete is like this, and it's resting on another surface, like this. The block of concrete weighs n, normal force n, and I want to know how much force F I have to generate to be able to overcome the resistance, uh, the friction in this case, the resistance at the interface between the concrete block and the, and the surface right here. So I can write that uh, F is equal to mu n. And actually, in soil mechanics, instead of a coefficient of friction, we write it uh, tangent phi. All right? We make uh, things a little bit different times the value of it. All right? If I divide by the area, so right here I have an area A. So if I divide F by A equals n divided by a times tangent phi, then I get the first equation, and f is the one that moves the block, so it's the force at failure, so therefore we get tau failure equal sigma tangent phi. All right? First equation, simple case, dry, I'm pulling the block, and the interface, I get tau f equals sigma tangent phi. Again, I'm trying to derive the, uh, the uh, equation for the shear strength of soil. All right. Second experiment. Experiment number two. Now, I'm putting the same, the same block on top of that surface, the block still weighs n. I'm trying to pull it out of there and move it with a force F. I still have the surface, but now I'm putting some glue uh, some glue between the block and the surface. So in that case, uh, this glue will generate a certain force, and when I write the equation, I've got to break that glue after it sets. So the force that I have to generate is going to be C to break the glue plus mu n. If I divide by areas, F equals F over A equals C over A plus mu N over A. This is going to be the shear strength of the interface. This is little c, the cohesion. And then sigma, the normal total stress, times tangent phi. Okay? So we moved from the first case, where we had no, no glue, if you wish, no cohesion, to the second case, where the equation uh, shows the influence of uh, cohesion. Let's do a third experiment. And this uh, third experiment uh, will, again, uh, become a little bit more complicated. Let me erase this. Experiment three. I still have the same block, uh, but now, uh, so let's say that uh, the surface is uh, somewhat irregular, and then here I have some again. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, in green. 
All right, so the surface at the bottom here is also irregular. And I have some water, so I have some glue, uh, some glue at the contacts. So I have that cohesion. And then I have some uh, water. I guess I'll use the green. Uh, I have some water in the in the middle of the pores here. Okay. So this is water. And then the blue is the glue. Uh, And the block still weighs n, and I want to know how much force F I have to generate to be able to uh, move that uh, rock. So now I can write that uh, F. I still have to break the glue, so I've got. Uh, let me keep the colors I use. So I've got F, I still have to break the glue, and I ha now I have the friction, but the weight of the block is N, and I have water pressure here. There's a water pressure, we'll call it U sub W, U for pressure, W for water. So now this water pressure is pushing up on the block, and the net force is N minus UW, the pressure, times the area. So this kind of uplift force that is pushing up on the block. So I don't have the full N value because the water is in, uh, in, is in compression. So if I divide all this by the area, I've got F over A equals C over A plus U times N over A minus uwa over a a over a so this cancel and then the final equation in this case is going to be tau sub f equal little c the cohesion plus sigma minus uw times tangent phi. okay so this is a more general case, and you can see it coming. This is an interface that, that is simulating the interface uh, within the soil. All right, experiment number four. So in experiment number four, we still are going to have water, but this water is, so in this case, uh, in this case, I should add uh, pores are saturated. Okay, there's water everywhere in the pores. The experiment number four, the pores are going to be partially filled. Now we're going to repeat. So now, I uh, still have the block, and I have uh, this rough interface, and then below this I have some uh, surface, and I still have the glue at the contacts that I'm going to have to break. And then I have some water, but not everywhere. So a little bit of water here, water here, water here, water here, and so on. So the, the water, so this is water, but the material is, if you wish, unsaturated. Unsaturated, but the water pressure is still UW. But because it is unsaturated, UW is in tension now uh, because you, you remember it's like the, when the material dries on the table uh, there's a fight between 
the attraction of the water to the, the, the soil particles on one end, and then the low relative humidity may be created by the sun. So the low relative humidity pulls the water in their direction, but the soil the particles pull in the other direction, the water finds itself in tension, uh, and, and that's how you generate these uh, uh, negative values. So this UW here is negative in this case. And the area that's covered uh, is, uh, we'll, we'll see how that impacts uh, the equation. So now we still have, uh, we still have the force N. The rock still weighs the same amount. And then we've got to push or to pull and break the interface with the force F. And then this, uh, this again right here is the group. All right. So let's write the equation this time. It says F is equal to, I still have to break the group, C plus mu times N minus UW, that's the water pressure, times the area of the water now, because the area is not the total area, okay? In this case, the area, because it was saturated, the area of the water was equal to the total area. But in this case, because the water is not everywhere, I must multiply by the area uh, associated with the water, not the total area. So if I divide by the total area, I get F over A, equals capital C over A plus mu times N over A minus U W A W over A. And if you recall, this was the alpha value that we talked about when we talked about the, uh, the when we discussed uh, water tension in soil. So this is tau F, the shear strength, little c, the cohesion, plus sigma minus aw over a is alpha uw times tangent phi. Okay, and that's a more expanded uh, equation for the expression of the shear strength uh, of a sort. Uh, at this point, I want to, uh, I'll, I'll do one more, let me see, yeah, we've got time to do that. So this is the, if you wish, the general equation, the one that I, I want you to remember, we'll frame it here. So in this equation, uh, Tau F is the soil shear strength. Okay. C is the, and we'll call it the effect of stress cohesion. Sigma is the total normal stress and then I want to put this one in, in uh, capital letter on the plane of failure. I put it in big capital letter, a different color here because you're going to forget this. And that question is going to be on the final. And uh, because that total stress, you see right here, that total stress is associated with this direction. The failure plane is right here. So this sigma is the total stress on the plane of failure. So don't forget this. And then sigma and now uh, alpha is the water area ratio. And a rough estimate is the degree of saturation. 
S, and then U W is uh, the uh, water stress. So it could be positive, it could be negative, and then phi is the effect of stress. Friction angle. Okay. Now, uh, this right here, this quantity is sigma prime. The effective stress, the effective normal stress on the plane of failure. If uh, I create a plot of if I create a plot of tau, the shear stress, versus the effective stress, then in that plot, this equation, which dictates the strength, the shear strength of the soil, I'm going to have tau f on this vertical axis, and I'm going to have sigma prime on the, this uh, expression here on the horizontal axis. So I've got, if you wish, y equals ax plus b. So I've got a straight line. And this straight line will have, when sigma prime is 0, right here, I'm going to have tau f equals c. Here is c, the cohesion, uh, effective stress cohesion. And then I have a straight line, and the slope of that straight line is tangent phi. And therefore, the angle of that straight line is uh, the friction angle phi. This is the failure angle. Right, we call this the failure. below the failure angle. But you cannot have a stress state that's above the failure angle. This is not possible. Okay, why? Because the stress state starts here, it gets up, 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 and boom, it fails. So I erased it, but you know that, that uh, stress strain curve that I showed you <coughs> would go here and come back down, but it cannot go on the other side because it would first fail when it reaches that, uh, that particular level. All right. Uh, now, some reasonable values uh, to finish this. Some reasonable values of C and uh, uh, of C and phi. So if we are <coughs> in, uh, two, you remember we have looked, we have talked about gravel, we have talked about sand, 
we have talked about silt and what we have talked about clay. Okay. Uh, we also uh, have mentioned, I believe, uh, what is normally consolidated and over consolidated. Uh, normally consolidated means that the soil has not seen any stress higher than the stress it is subjected to today. Over consolidated soils are soils where the stress today is uh, lower than the stress used to be in the past. For example, if you were in Chicago uh, about 10,000 years ago, uh, you would be under about 300 meters of ice. That was a lot of weight on the soil, and that soil has been pre-stressed, pre-consolidated, over-consolidated by 300 meters of ice. Today, the ice is gone, the material is over-consolidated. Now, if you go to New Orleans, and in New Orleans, uh, there was no ice. The ice basically stopped around St. Louis, you know, to the 10,000, the glaciers came down to about St. Louis. Level. So if you're in New Orleans, there was no ice, uh, and the material keeps being deposited by the Mississippi River coming through and eroding the country, depositing it in the Gulf of Mexico. The material in New Orleans is normally consolidated because the stress today is equal to the stress 10,000 years ago. So there is no uh, pre-consolidation in this in this type of material. So. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe we can put normally consolidated here and over consolidated here. Right. And when you think of the, these types of materials here, we're probably talking about uh, uh, 30 to as high as 45 degrees for feet and zero for C. Okay? There's no cohesion, basically, in sand and uh, gravel. When it comes to silts and clays, uh, the friction angle is typically lower, and it could be as low as 20 to 30 degrees for feet. And one of the, one of the uh, things that impacts this friction angle is the plasticity index, because the higher the plasticity index, the smaller the particles, and typically uh, the slicker they are, the, the, the uh, less friction they uh, generate. So you could have some uh, high plasticity clays that have uh, friction angles of uh, about 20 degrees. And then here I would say normally consolidated soils, C equals zero, and then over consolidated soils, C uh, maybe 5 to 20, uh, 25 kilopascal. Okay? So this gives you an idea of what these uh, typical values So C equals 0, C equals 0, except for those. So that means that in this equation, this is the big term. And Soils are primarily frictional materials. Sometimes we have some glue, like we do in over consolidated material, but most of the time soils will be frictional materials. So that, that's critically important to uh, remember. And then these, uh, these are some of the range of values that you can expect in, uh, in uh, typical uh, soil. That concludes the first lecture on uh, soil shear strength.